Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9. Good to be with you this morning. Good to be here. I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. I was. Um, I'm just, my mind is uh, kind of, I won't say it's spinning because that'll make me dizzy, but um, God laid a message on my heart yesterday. Actually, it was a few days ago. And uh, I struggled with it. I wasn't sure, you know, boy, is this it? Or, and it's like it gets late and I say, God, either this is the message or something, but this is what I'm going to work on. And if you give me something else, that's fine. But if you don't, I'm just going to go with this. And don't get me wrong, it's a good, it's a good teaching type sermon. Um, and you never know sometimes why God lays certain things on your heart had something happen today that when it happened I went well that's in my sermon that's in my sermon so I, I get it now I do I like it Revelation chapter 9 the fifth trumpet and uh, we're looking at the number we were looking at the number five last uh, last Sunday to get the idea and the meaning of the number five because it plays into this uh, this teaching it plays into uh, what the fifth trumpet is all about because there's there's an event that's going to take place at the sounding of this fifth trumpet that has never happened in earth's history before never has it happened and you'll see that when we get I'm not going to tell it to you now if you study it and figure it out that's fine but I'm not going to tell you yet. We've got to wait for it. So let's look at the scriptures. Revelation 9 verse 1. The fifth angel sounded. And I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. Uh, to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit. And there arose a smoke out of the pit. As the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened. By reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth and um, I believe that these are not just normal ordinary everyday run-of-the-mill African plague locusts okay these are spirits uh, whoever read uh, the book by Hal Lindsey the late great planet earth who's ever read that book George I kind of thought you had Gary you ever read that book okay um, Hal Lindsey uh, sort of really kind of fueled um, the Bible prophecy in, the, in mainstream Christianity. He came out with a book in the early 70s called The Late Great Planet Earth. And um, I remember reading that book um, years ago. And when Hal was trying to discern what was going on here in Revelation chapter 9, what he did was he tried to apply things that he saw uh, in this world, something outside of the Bible, and use that to interpret things inside the Bible. And um, what he said was that as he's reading, if you look in Revelation 9, I have to turn Revelation 9 twice because this sheet of paper is ripped in half. So I have to go like that. In Revelation 9, verse uh, 7, verses 7, 8, 9, 10, uh, 11, it gives you a description of these locusts and how they appear. Uh, for instance, it says they had um, uh, looked like crowns on their heads that sounded like horses running to battle. They had the faces of men. They had the hair of women. Their teeth was like lions. They had the sound of their wings, breastplates of iron, sound of chariots, and many horses running to battle. They had tails like in the scorpions. And were stings in their tails and so on. Hal Lindsey said, that is a perfect description of Apache attack helicopters. That's what he said. And he's like, yeah, the, you know, the, the, the helicopters are shaped like locusts or long. And he said the, um, the, the sound of the propellers is like horses running to battle. And he said, the faces of men. And he said, you know, there's two windows in there look like eyes. And he said, there's a man sitting in there. 
this is before they let women in the Air Force. And uh, he said, the hair of women is the, the deal on that. I guess the woman goes like this with her hair. Yeah. Well, that will make you dizzy. Um, I can't remember what he said about their teeth as lions. Uh, breastplates of iron. Sound of their uh, chariots running to battle. And they, they had stings in their tails. And he said that was the missiles that they fired. So I guess in his mind that uh, the Antichrist was going to go out and attack everybody with helicopters. That was his interpretation of it. And I went, and in my younger days, I'm going, wow, that is so cool. And he explained it like this. Here is John living in the uh, first century AD, and he sees something now from the 20th century, and he can't wrap his head around it. He can't figure it out. He doesn't know exactly what he's looking at. So he uses a descriptive language that um, is his best guess at what he's seeing. He's taking like the, the, the rotor on the top and saying that that looked to him like a woman's hair. Um, I would like to see a woman make her hair like into two helicopter rotors. That would be weird. Yeah. Um, but he's, he is describing something he's never seen before and using things that he has seen in his day to describe them. And, uh, and I, you know, like I say, when I was younger, much younger, uh, I thought that was really, really neat. However, uh, when I was a child, I spake as a child and understood as a child. Now that I'm uh, old, I put away childish things. And that is a childish, to me, it's a childish interpretation. What, what he's really seeing here is exactly what he describes. Because remember, this is not John's words. We don't call it the word of John. We don't call it the word of Paul. We don't call it the word of Isaiah. We call it the word of God. Holy men spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so these words, the, the, the flaw, the, the primary flaw in his thinking was thinking that John was being forced to interpret something using words that were really inadequate to describe what he's seeing. I disagree. I think John described exactly what he saw. I think he wrote it down exactly the way he saw it. I think God, the Holy Spirit, gave him the exact words to write down. And this is precisely what it was. It's an army of locusts that are released on the earth. They did not come from a hangar. They did not come from a uh, aircraft carrier. They came, they didn't come from a missile silo. They came from the bottomless pit. That's where they came from. Um, how did they get there? God put them there. And, they're, and when we see the extra descriptions of them, uh, we'll go to other places in the Bible and I'll show you. This is, this is how spirits are defined uh, in other places in the scriptures. So anyway, uh, verse 4, it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing. So we know that we're dealing with a different type of locust, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. That seal of God we saw in Revelation 7. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. Now, last uh, Sunday morning, we started looking at this number five. Um, there was something here. Oh, yeah, the five months. Um, I don't remember what I said last Sunday, so I'm going to ask you to remember what I said, and nobody ever does. So don't feel bad. If I don't remember it, you don't have to remember it. But anyway, did I, did I show you that this five-month period 
is exactly the same time that the waters prevailed on the earth. Okay, I thought I did. So we have a, we have a connection in the Bible. This is God telling you the thing that hath been is that which shall be. There's no new thing under the sun. So we go back to Genesis 7 and we look and we see that exact time frame and we know it can't be an accident. Because God, God's word is here a little and there a little. And every, um, seek ye out the book of the Lord and read, none of these shall fail, no one shall want her mate. So we know that things in the book of Revelation or other places in the New Testament is going to be linked with things that are in the Old Testament. And they're going to give us a, a much broader picture of what it is that we're seeing. So we have a connection now to the days of Noah which is what Christ said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be the coming of the Son of Man. And we go back and we see an actual, there's a couple of time periods in, in Genesis 7. The first of all is the seven days. Uh, God tells Noah, for yet seven days and I will uh, destroy the earth. And sure enough, seven days later, boom, here it comes. Uh, God, God's not late. He's not early. He's right on time. And then we have the 150 day time prophecy and even the Bible is giving you uh, the exact date that it started and the exact date that it stopped it says on the 17th day of the second month did the waters come down and come up but and then on the 17th day of the seventh month that the waters stopped going up now we know that it rained 40 days that 40 days is part of the 150 days so for the first 40 days it rains. Waters are coming up out of the heart of the earth. Um, by the way, I, I read an article a few weeks ago. And it just goes to show you that God's word's been right now for over 6,000 years already. And what the, what the article said was scientists have determined that there is a body of water underneath the crust of the earth that actually contains more water than can be found in all of the oceans put together. Imagine that, George. Imagine that, that the Bible says that the fountains of the deep opened up and all of this water comes gushing out on the earth. Scientists have a problem with a worldwide flood is, well, it just doesn't work. There's not that much water under the ground and blah, blah, blah. Well, now they found it. They found the exact reservoir of water that God placed there that he used to flood the entire earth. I mean, every inch of ground covered on this earth. It even covered, that went above the highest mountain at that time. I don't know that, I don't know that Mount Everest was the tallest mountain back then? I don't know. Uh, but it covered the highest mountain 15 cubits above the highest mountain, the Bible says. So we're dealing with a ton of water, which would have done uh, several things. Number one, it would have killed all breathing life forms on the earth and probably a large portion of the fish. But it would have killed them. And as their bodies died, they were instantly covered with huge amounts of water. How much does water weigh? Eight pounds a gallon. That's heavy. Okay? So eight pounds a gallon. We don't know how many gallons, but all of that water pressing down now upon the carcasses of everything that has died, what would it do? It would force calcium and minerals into the flesh of those animals or those fish, or those birds, or those people, it would force that those minerals into that and press them into there and literally would form fossils in a matter of weeks rather than a ma matter of a million years. Because fossils to me don't make sense if some animal just dies somewhere and we're supposed to believe that a million years later it turns to rock. Well, whenever an animal dies in the woods, if you go looking for it six months later, will you find it? What happens, Sterling? 
it rots. And we have fossils that are so, um, so well preserved that we can, we can actually see the, the tiny little grooves and striations on the scales of reptiles and dinosaurs. We have dinosaur eggs where we can actually see the dinosaur still in the egg. Um, it's fossilized, but practically every detail of that little baby dinosaur in the egg has been preserved. Now, that doesn't make sense if you don't have some something going on in the world that puts a huge amount of pressure down on those fossils, on those dead creatures, and forces all those minerals into it to preserve them as a, living, as a dead testimony, a living testimony, for all mankind to see thousands of years later. What would you expect to see if you had a, a universal flood? Billions of dead things buried in layers, scattered all over the earth. That's exactly what you would think to see, and that's exactly what we see. You would also see layers of rocks and minerals and dirt laid down in layers. We know that because we know that it happened that way because of Mount St. Helens. 1980, Mount St. Helens blew the whole side of the mountain off, and all of these ash and minerals and rocks falling down and water everywhere and it built up if you go there now you can see the layers just like on the side of the highway when they dig through little hills on the sideway you see layers in the rocks you go to mount st helens that's exactly what you see there and it didn't take millions of years to lay those layers down it took a few months at best it took a few months so anyway back back to revelation 9 we better move on um but it's going to be as it was in the days of Noah. Okay, Only God is not going to flood the earth with water. He's going to flood the earth with ungodliness. Ungodly men, the Bible says. They shall come in as a flood. Um, in Genesis 1, we talked about the number 5. We started looking at what it meant. On day 5, God created the... Uh, oh, hush. God created the uh, birds of the air and uh, the fish of the sea which to me is also interesting because the water that fell on the earth in the days of noah came from two sources the air and the deep gushed forth okay so we have and we have great whales and there's a story in the bible about a whale but this whale represents something um in the evening in the morning were the fifth day and then Genesis 5, I showed you this pattern in Genesis 5, uh, and it's consistent. Every person mentioned in Genesis chapter 5, they're mentioned five times, and the fifth time they're mentioned, it says, and they died. The only person to break the pattern is Enoch, number one. Enoch lived, he never died, and was translated into heaven. The second person to break the pattern was Noah. Noah, the fifth time Noah's mentioned, it says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Um, so the number five represents death. And when we look other places in the Bible, we find it consistently. Count these words that the serpent said to Eve. How many words? Five. And those very words, what did they produce in Eve? What did they bring to her? Death. Because the moment she believed what the serpent said, ye shall not surely die. She ate the fruit. What happened? She died eventually, but she died. Death, uh, the Bible says, as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. So, um, how many books did Moses write? It's called the Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay, and the Bible, the New Testament, Paul called that the law of sin and death. He called it the ministration of death. So the law coming down to mankind at the hands of Moses brings death because it, um, it makes sin abundant. There's not just one thing that we do that violates God's commandments. There's lots of things that we do 
that violate God's word and violate God's commandments and sin is a transgression of the law. And because of that, death comes upon all men. Uh, Paul said in Romans 5 that death reigned from Adam to Moses. So Adam dies in the fifth chapter of the Bible being mentioned five times and he died. What book of the Bible did Moses die in? Huh? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You guessed it, didn't you? He died in the book of Deuteronomy, fifth book of the Bible. Death reigned from Adam to Moses. Okay? So, um, this all has a point now. Uh, Jonah, when he's describing being in the whale's belly, I think we read this last week, he's, he says he's in the belly of hell. There it is right there. And thou heardest my voice. Jesus said that the sign that's going to be given is the sign of Jonas. As Jonas was in the whale's belly three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. And he only did that after he died. Now, oh, Adam dies, fifth chapter. Moses dies in the fifth book. Um, I don't have this on the screen, but you can write this down if you want. If you look, turn to Matthew. Turn to the book of Matthew, if you would. And I'll give you a little... People like this kind of stuff. So I like to give it out. Um, yeah, I like this. Matthew chapter 4, turn there. Satan. The name Satan, S-A-T-A-N, is mentioned exactly 55 times in this Bible. And Satan has the power of what? Death. Okay, so in Matthew chapter four, Satan comes to Jesus, who's in the wilderness and he tempts him. First time is in verse three. If thou be the son of God, command these stones to be made to bread. In verse four, we have the words of Jesus. If you have a red letter Bible, it's easy to pick them out. If you count the words that Jesus spoke here, write that number down and hang on to that number. And then in verse 6, Satan tempts him again with Scripture, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. In verse 7, Jesus quotes Scripture again. He says, it is written, again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. There's also another number there. Okay? And then in verse 9, Satan said, all these things will I give thee if thou shalt fall down and worship me. In verse 10, we have the words of Jesus again. Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And then the devil leaveth him. So, if you count the words Jesus spoke in verse 4, verse 7, and verse 10, and add them together, you're going to get 55 words exactly. Man didn't make this Bible. God did. Satan's mentioned 55 times. Jesus speaks 55 words to him. And it basically is, Satan, you're dead. You're done. And all of those quotations in verse 4, verse 7, and verse 10, do you know where they come from? Huh? What part? Deuteronomy. Fifth book of the Bible. I think Jesus knew something, amen? Mm hmm. Yep. Um, there's nine things there in the sermon in the in the Beatitudes. Anyway, uh, Romans five. I have it up on the screen. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So sin comes in. Adam dies in chapter five, verse five. Death by sin. So death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed where there is no law. So nevertheless, death reigned from Adam, fifth chapter, fifth verse, to Moses, fifth book of the Bible, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. So we have a connection here with the number five again. Now, um, this is that stuff that you should have learned in high school biology or college biology and you forgot because you said you never need it. I was the 
my asked my mom, I was the worst student ever. And it wasn't that I couldn't understand anything. I was lazy. I'd rather watch Gilligan's Island. Okay? And I never took notes. Even in Bible college, I didn't take notes. Now I take notes. Because I went back and looked at this word, apoptosis. Sounds like pop-tarts. Apoptosis. Every cell in the human body has a genetic code written into it that kills the cell. It's a kill switch for the cell. Because if we never, if our cells in our body never died, they just kept dividing and making more, what would happen after five years? That child would be so big, we wouldn't be able to live in a house. And if a man lives a hundred years, and none of his cells died, they just keep building on to it, he becomes this humongous blob that can't do anything. So God, because of Adam, put into our genetic code apoptosis, programmed cell death. After the cell lives so long, all of a sudden, this piece of genetic code kicks in and it kills the cell. Everything must die. Amen? Everybody dies. So Now, there is an exception to this. There's a type of cells that don't die. Cancer. Something about cancer shuts off in the cancer cells only programmed cell death. That's why tumors keep getting bigger. That's why that little tip of a pin spot that my wife had had to be taken out and to avoid the risk everything else that went with it because they knew that it wasn't going to stay that small very long because the cells that began as cancer cells would have still been there and over time that mass would have grown and grown and killed her so it's even written into our genetic code that we must die. Amen? Hebrews 2. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Okay? Now, I'm going to take you... I'm going to turn to Isaiah 14. Here's where we're going with this. My belief that, and if, if you have a different idea, that's fine. Um, but my belief in, Gen in Revelation 9, when it says, The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. My belief is that's Lucifer, Satan. So why do you say that? Well, stars are angels, both good and bad. And the verse says that it's the star was a him. In other words, it describes a personality or a personhood to the star. And that this star did something. A key was given to this star. The star fell from heaven. And the star then is going to open with that key, the bottomless pit. When you compare that Revelation 9 verse 1 with what we see in Isaiah 14 to me it just adds to it if we start in verse 10 this is uh, the prophecy concerning Lucifer all they shall speak and say unto thee art thou also become weak as we art thou become like unto us thy pomp is brought down to the what grave that's a death word and noise of thy vials thy vials violins, stringed instruments, because 
When we read Ezekiel 28, we find out that Satan, Lucifer, is made up of musical instruments. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee. And so we have tabrets and pipes in Ezekiel. We have violins or vials in Isaiah. Uh, the noise of thy vials. The worm is spread under thee and the worms cover thee. That's death. Now verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Uh, and I'm going to stop right here just for a minute. I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to give you an example of why it's important that you have the right Bible. I actually saw this firsthand. It didn't hit me uh, right away uh, until like the other day, actually. Um, I was going through the recording that I made when I was teaching the pastors in uh, Turkana. And I was showing them the differences in Bibles. And I asked the question now to uh, all of these good men, and I love them dearly, I asked them who uh, the morning star was. And some of them said, the devil. Now, where did they get that from? Well, they don't. They, a lot of them didn't read English, or they said they didn't, but they had a Bible. I I don't know if it was in Swahili or Turkana, but their Bible in Isaiah 14 said, "How art thou fallen from heaven, O morning star?" And so, without these pastors having uh, anybody to teach them different, or without them having access to you know study materials or anything like that they believed what they were reading because they were told it's the Bible and they had concluded in their mind based upon their Bible's reading of Isaiah 14 12 that the morning star was Lucifer so it had an effect on them they believed wrongly they believed a false doctrine, a false idea. Because I said, and I, when, they, when I asked the question, I said, who is the morning star? And some of them said the devil. I went, no. And I'll release that video today. But um, I said, um, I asked them, I think, who, um, who is it mentioned here in verse 12? And some of them said Jesus, and I, because it says morning star. And I said, no, no, no. I said, Jesus didn't fall from heaven. He came down willingly. He wasn't kicked out of heaven. He wasn't thrown out. He wasn't cast out. We see Satan cast out in Revelation 12. We see Jesus saying it. Um, I see Satan follows lightning from heaven. And so I had to, I had to try to clear up the confusion that their faulty Bible had created in their minds. Some was saying that verse 12 was Jesus. Some was saying that the morning star was the devil. And it's because that's what their Bible taught them. Now, verse uh, three, 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend it. And, and let's do this. I will, I will, I will. You see all these I wills here. Number one, I will ascend into heaven. Two, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Three, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. The north is where heaven is. No, I don't believe the North Pole or where the Santa Claus and his elves are. Uh, number four, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Number five, I will be like the most high. So he says five things here. And then it follows up with verse 14 or verse 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. And is that true? Is Satan going to be down, cast down to the pit? Yes. We see that in Revelation. So we know then that this whole section of the Bible is referring to the devil who the King James rightfully says is Lucifer. And the word Lucifer means 
bearer of light or bringer of light, which is interesting because in um, 2 Corinthians, um, what is it, chapter 11, where it talks about Satan himself is transformed into a what? An angel of light. The word angel is messenger. A messenger of light and a bringer of light are the same thing. So we have a double witness, one in 2 Corinthians, one in Isaiah, that the name Lucifer is the right name. And I will just bring in all of our Satan worshiper friends who know that when they worship Lucifer, they know they're worshiping the devil. They call themselves Luciferian for a reason. So it's no mystery to them who Lucifer is. All right. So anyway, huh? Yeah, we're Masons. Exactly right. Albert Pike said it in Morals and Dogma. Okay. Uh, he is like in awe of Lucifer because he's like, why would God give this angel, this angel that everybody says is bad, this grandiose name of the one who brings the light to the world? And I'm going, boy, you got it wrong. But that's, I believe that um, if you go back and look at verse 12, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? And you look at Revelation 9 again, I saw a star fall from heaven uh, to the earth and to, unto him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Now let's go back to Revelation chapter 9. How much time we have left? Where's the bell? Uh, let me just read this very quickly and then we'll close. Uh, when it says in verse 4 and verse 5, we'll read those together. Let me see if I can put it up on the screen here for you. At least part of it. Uh, and it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing nor any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. In verse 5, And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. If you look in verse 6, and in those days shall men seek what? The bell. Seek death. And shall not find it. And shall desire to die. And death shall flee from them. Now, here's the event that we take from this. Is that these locusts are going to come out. And they're going to target everybody, just like the destroyer in Exodus. He sees the blood. He knows he can't go in that house. These, these devils are looking for the seal of God. And when they see somebody that has the seal of God, they know they can't touch them. And so they don't. They only sting. And sting is a death word. Oh, death. Where is thy sting? And the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. 1 Corinthians 15. So these, these devils here sting everybody on the earth who doesn't have the seal of God. And because of that sting, for five months, nobody dies. Nobody does which has never happened ever on this earth. Every second, you have, I don't know how many people all over the world dying. Every minute, probably have thousands of people dropping dead all over the earth. It's what fuels the, the uh, funeral business, the cemetery business. Everybody's got to die, so everybody's going to need to be buried somewhere or cremated or... Uh, thrown overboard into the sea or whatever, but everybody dies thousands of times every minute. But now here for five months, people, verse 6, are going to seek death and they won't be able to find it. They're going to be in so much torment that death would be preferred over life, but they won't be able to to die that's bad amen and I, I just you know just think about that for a while and tell God thank you that you're saved amen 
Um, oh, what was I going to say after that? Boy, it was real good too. I don't remember it. I guess that's God telling me shut up. Let's go to prayer. You ponder that for a while. You think about that. Nobody dies for five months. Okay? Father, we ask your blessings on your word. And give us light and understanding. Lord, I don't understand things out of here that I've been reading for years. Lord, I ask you, God, to give me light. Give me understanding. Add to the things, Lord, that you've blessed me with. And uh, do likewise with those who seek you out inside this amazing book. Father, we're glad, Lord, that we have the truth, we know the truth. Help us, dear God, to be about your business and the ministry that you've given us to share, Lord, what this book says with as many people around the world as we can. Bless this Sunday school time, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.